Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Kelly Driscoll. In this episode, you'll hear part two of my conversation with Jill Flanders Crosby from University of Alaska Anchorage. More links and information about today's conversation can be found on Digication's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Full episodes of Digication Scholars Conversations can be found on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. You are about to hear part two of our conversation with Jill Flanders Crosby from University of Alaska Anchorage. Please be sure to listen to our previous episode to hear part one of this conversation. Do you think that because of the, you know, you kind of had two levels, you had the support from your mother and then kind of this need to prove yourself with your brother, right? Um, if that has impacted the way that you teach. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it has, it, 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 you know, all of our experiences impact the way that we teach. And this has given me the further drive to let my students know, again, we're not just answers. Mm -hmm. And that this work that you do is valuable and meaningful and contributes to the larger field of understanding and scholarship. And, you know, that's what education is all about. And I don't necessarily mean formal education, but being curious, being inquisitive, and finding ways to learn more and finding ways to disseminate that out in whatever way you can, whether it's, you know, as a new work of choreography or an art installation or this brilliant e-portfolio that you create. And that's not to say that education is not important, but because it is, because we all need to come from a place of knowing what went before us and learning how to evaluate information and sources such that we keep making the world a better place mm -hmm. is one of the most important things I can probably teach to my students while I can teach to them. And whatever your platform is, is it as a dancer? Is it as an actor? Is it as a biologist? Whatever your platform contribute to the knowledge of the world, contribute to the lived experience, make our life world sing and be joyful and meaningful and make us be reflective and question ourselves and question what has come before us and what we can do in the future. That's what I try to give to my mm. students. And the experiences that I've had with, with people who doubted what is possible in dance and then suddenly seeing what is possible in dance is part of that conversation. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, this definitely supports what I was speaking about in the beginning of our conversation. You know, I think through what you're describing that you have just become this in, incredible source of, um, you know, empowerment for your students, wherever yes. they are in that yes. journey. I mean, what a wonderful calling yes. to them, an invitation, you know, yes. through your work, whatever yes. medium discipline it may be. Make this world. Exactly. Yeah, make this world better. And, and that became so important last year during yeah. the pandemic from, you know, my 100 level students, you know, I had one student who, who I wouldn't, it's not that she was not a dancer because she did hip hop in her off mm -hmm. time, but she was so struggling with being on Zoom yeah. and, and about ready to, you know, flunk out of all her classes and I just kept working with her, trying to empower her and empower her. And this may not seem related, but, but it kind of is when we talk about e-portfolio as alternative methods of assessment. I kept trying to find ways in which I could say, oh, it's okay that you can't get here, 
let's think about mm-hmm. this. How can I help you? Let's find ways to make this work for you. And in the end, she wound up being able to pass all her classes when the teacher said, mm, you're going to fail. And she turned in a beautiful e-portfolio. I, I make them do multimodal presentations. Mm-hmm. So through e-portfolio, they document the process of a four-page research paper at the 100 level. So they start with their introduction and their about me, and then they have to do their topic proposal, Mm -hmm. and then they do their two-page draft, and then they do their research paper. And all along the way, they all have to have visual materials, not just black and white text, you know, pop it out, bring it alive, make it dance. And then they have to do a multimodal presentation that they put up on ePortfolio, which is an alternate modality in itself, but they're multimodal. It's images and voice and films and, you know, thinking about ways that you make that multimodal, you know, come alive. And her multimodal was just, you know, beautiful. And it with my higher level dancers, I, I'm not sure if we talked about this already, who had the ability to do embodied performance taken away from them. Yeah. You know, and by embodied, I mean face to face with people, other people in the room. Then it became my role to empower them through how are you going to be able to do the same thing so creatively and innovatively through Mm ePortfolio, we're going to make the portfolios dance. You're going to treat your portfolio like a work of choreography. And as you know, the work that they did was simply beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I, I, I was actually rather surprised at the, emotional response that I had to viewing mm-hmm. some of their e-portfolios. You know, I got a little teary at some point and I was like, oh, keep it together, Kelly, because you're going to need to talk to this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. I would look at those, but I'm like, oh my God. Oh my <laughs> what gosh. they did was, I know, it was amazing. It's remarkable. And, and you could tell it, came, you could, and you could tell it came from a place of, you know, Was it because at that moment, so many of us were going through so much, but it came from a place of, of real commitment and dedication. And I think more than anything, that's what rang true, this place of deep commitment to art making that was expressed through ePortfolio. Yes. Yes. Despite all of the restrictions and, and challenges exactly and I was curious because many of them because of the pandemic and not being able to perform in spaces that they maybe normally would have gravitated Mm -hmm. to like a stage (laughs) um that many of them chose to perform outside in nature and um it seemed to just for you know nature really became part of the the story yes and yes that was something that i i also just got really emotional about yes yes and yes uh it was a very powerful kind of union of who they are with their very little literal roots in the world yes and yes. uh i, I was, well, we really didn't yeah we just no, oh i was on. just Sorry. gonna ask you um you know, when, when they were, you know, kind of given the, the prompts or, um, you know, kind of requirements for what they were going to be doing, if, um, as a group, there were conversations about where their performances were going to take place, um, 
and Mm -hmm. you know you probably saw from them kind of that that decision making process and I was just really curious to learn from from your perspective how that may have shifted last year because of the the pandemic and um as a as their as their teacher what that may have meant for you too yeah yeah well we really didn't have much choice Mm -hmm. and that was that was one thing that I kept saying to them go dance outside Mm -hmm. we didn't have any choice because we couldn't come into the university at all I mean we could but under very strict limitations and when we could come in, we did do a real brief in the fall, a very brief um, student showcase uh, in which we had about a 20-minute film where they could come in one or two or three at a mm-hmm. time. The spring got a little bit different. We could bring the uh, restrictions eased a little bit, but still a lot of them made the decision to be outside because being outside was being deemed so much Mm -hmm. safer. So I really encourage them, you know, go outside. You want to have, you want to do something where it's more than just yourself, go outside because that is, you know, as we understand it is safer. Um, But you're absolutely right for those of us that live in Alaska you know, nature is all around us all the time. And it, it, be, it, I think we also found, at least this was very true for a project that I did, you know, when you're in the confines of your house, the walls start to close down on you. And when you're outside in nature, it's everything is open. Now, what is it you're doing? Maybe being in, and I would try to, to tell some students if they were filming. So, um, for example, my improvisation class and my choreography class also did e-portfolios. And I would say, okay, you're having to film in your house, but how do you think about coming from different angles Mm -hmm. and how that's going to look on the screen? And how do you think about, you know, do you take that feeling of that room and transfer it into what it is that you're trying to do Uh, choreographically or through improvisation but it really did become a way that the students could feel like they could film do more because at least their stage was outside Mm -hmm. it got cold in the middle of winter but (laughs) really cold I remember one day no in the snow, I know, I know, and and our our this has nothing to do with e-portfolio, but for our um, spring concert, a lot of them did make you know the choreography that I did. We were outside in the middle of winter on a frozen mm. lake, dancing in the snow, and my dancers talked about, oh my God, after this one take, I couldn't feel my <laughs> fingers anymore, and you know, I, I had I had hand warmers to put in their gloves, and I told them to bring really big you know warm coats, but it gave us that opportunity to have that freedom that we didn't feel we had otherwise. We were not mask mandated outside in Alaska. That said, when we did film, I made sure that outside my dancers were far away from each other, you know, at least 10 feet away from each other. And, and, and I wound up constructing the choreography built around that very principle. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the other dancers chose to film outside, but be closer together with masks Mm -hmm. on you know so it became about how do we take it became about how do we see our new requirements not be a restriction but be an opening and so going back to e-portfolio that was what I kept stressing to them don't see this as a restriction as to what you cannot do see this as a new opportunity as to what you can do and how you're going to learn from building this e-portfolio and keep thinking about how you can take the cyber world choreographic process into the embodied choreographic process 
and vice versa. As you start choreographing again in the live embodied space, what did you learn from creating e-portfolios that now becomes the whole circle Mm -hmm. of this new you as an artist scholar? Yeah, and it's, I, I think for really any discipline, kind of going back to that idea of expanding your thinking about, you know, what, what could be your stage for performance, you know, anywhere in the world. Exactly. You know, in our kind of concept of how we exist and move through space, whether it's in a digital environment yes. or a physical environment. Exactly. Um, exactly. Exactly. Consideration, um, you know, and how we may make our mark on, on the world or on the interwebs. Exactly. <laughs> And it's not only, you know, what is your stage, it is what is the way you're going to disseminate your information and how. And the one thing that I kept stressing to them about ePortfolio is this is a place to tell your story. So it was not only thinking about it as a choreography, but as a storytelling narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, because choreography in, in, absolutely every 100% of the way is telling a story. But now you're going to tell your story, just like oftentimes an academic paper is telling a story, but this gives you a a different way to tell your story that becomes more personal, but is still grounded in research and scholarship. This is not you just, you know, blah, 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 (laughs) but grounded in research and scholarship on an alternative platform that allows you to be just as creative as your choreographic self. Although oftentimes I will tell students, do not ever think that academic writing is not just as creative. You know, in in the book that I just co-authored with my writing partner, J.T. Torres, you know, about my two decades of research, I worked with what I called a choreographed narrative. So for me, when I was writing the text, I had to keep thinking of it like a choreography. Mm. And when I read it, did I feel like I was moving through a piece of choreography in the ways that I love to move? You know, did I have that that movement preference as I read the rhythm and the Mm. flow of the words and did the story unfold in a way that, you know, when I'm dancing, I like to move. And so that was a real lesson for me. And I keep, that's another thing I keep trying to really stress to my students about the fact that your dance making carries through everything that you do and can exist in many different platforms from the embodied stage to the e-portfolio to the dance film that you create to the art installation. Always carry that with you and always value that as vital, emergent, intelligent, and rigorous art-making scholarship because that's exactly what it is. And don't ever let anyone tell you differently oh wow (laughs) Jill I love that I'm I'm going to carry that with me now thinking about you know even something like writing as a as a um a way to continue dancing and uh yeah thank you so much for that And, uh, you know, I feel like I could talk to you for days, but we we have reached the end of our time together today. Um, But before we say our goodbyes, um, I did want to give you the opportunity to speak a little bit about uh, some of your students' e-portfolios, and there's no time restriction here. Exactly. Um, because I know that there are um, some 
students and e-portfolios that you're incredibly excited about and we will definitely share links to them in the description of our yes, conversation please. so that others have the opportunity to uh, go and explore yes. them and get yes. inspired by them. Yes. But I wanted to give yes. you a chance if there were some things that you wanted to mention uh, specifically about some of that, that work. Yeah. Um, rather than necessarily calling out individual names, because I think you will share the yeah. links of all the ones who made their portfolios public, what the students did that was so beautiful to me was they found ways to think about the portfolio page as a work of choreography, how your eye would move from one image to another, mm -hmm. or how they might layer for example, when you look at the page, there's this whole side that is a voice recording of a student assignment, which happened to be for the performative ethnography assignment. And then on this side, you see the images of them capturing what they were doing. So, you know, to talk about the site, what are you seeing at this moment? And then there would be a film next mm -hmm. to it, the voice recording, and then a film next to it or of the ways that they would weave the multiple modalities from the text to the sound recording to the image. And then that image would be a gallery that would unfold like a book, you know, of more images to look at. It's sort of like you're skimming through pages of a book or the ways that they loaded their PowerPoints to unfold like a book rather than scroll mm -hmm. down or the ways that they filmed their improvisational studies and choreographic studies and loaded them on the page or one student who who in some ways felt like she didn't really have the skills to film but what she wound up creating was so beautiful in the ways that she took a lot of conceptual images and brought a research paper alive through those images and then the way she placed it in her e-portfolio that was just so resonant. They, they found ways to make the pages move, to make them pop three-dimensionally. And they all did it through understanding the process of dancing. And while several had not yet had training in the choreographic process, Others did, but even those that didn't have training in the choreographic process could already sense what to do with the visuality. Even my 100-level students, there's one e-portfolio from a 100-level student that did the same thing. And, I, and, and so Paul Wasco was just in my class yesterday, and I had all my 100-level students start submitting their portfolios last night, and I'm already like, oh, my God. You know at what they're already <laughs> able to do um in in ways that are it's just it's so inspiring for me to see and you know so now it's my role as a teacher to keep nurturing that but but yeah no that's what my students did and like I said I I tried to tell them make your e-portfolio dance and they did that yeah. they made them dance through not only the movement of the eye, but then the movement we would see in their videos and how they would film them. They brought, they found that way, as you said earlier, to bring this emotional quality into their filming just by being outside, mm -hmm. you know, and, and teaching them to be wide open and awake with all their senses, you know, who the famous philosopher Maxine Green always told students to be wide open and awake at all moments so that everything you see around you, you smell, you touch, you taste, how do you, how do you represent that? And they did that through their e-portfolio. They thought about how do we represent touch and taste and smell as well as movement. And I'm so extremely proud of the work that they did. I hope Everyone listening to this has a chance to go through their portfolios and witness the work that the students did under the weight of the year that is the pandemic. Yeah. Gorgeous work. 
gorgeous work. Well, thank you again, Jill, for your time today and for everything you do for your students and for arts advocacy. You are such a, a treasure and uh, I have so enjoyed thank talking you. to you today. Thank you very much. And the same with you, Kelly. It was an honor and a pleasure. Take good care. Digication Scholars Conversations is brought to you by Digication, a technology platform powering the most innovative ePortfolio programs in K-12 and higher education. Our website can be found at digication.com. This episode was produced by Drew Albanicius. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for watching.